Dear Lord, we thank you, Father, for, Lord, your presence, for your glory, Lord God. And, Lord, we ask now, Lord Jesus, that we prepare our hearts to hear from you, to hear your word, Father, that you would, uh, Lord, help us, Lord God. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts. Open the ears of our hearts so that we not only hear, but we understand, O oh God. And give us the ability, O oh God, to get this word into our hearts so that, Lord, it would, uh, Lord, see deep. And, Lord, grow roots, O oh God. And help us, O oh God, to change from glory to glory. God, we thank you and praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen. 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 Yes, let's give the Lord one more hand clap offering. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, present. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, at this time, the children are dismissed to go to their children's church so that they could learn about Jesus in their own environment. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I wanted to uh, introduce some very, very special guests to my wife and I and uh, my family. And uh, before I introduce the speaker and his wife, I want to introduce another very, very special couple. Uh, uh, Pastor Dave and Monique, could you stand, please? They are pastors at Christ Tabernacle, where our guest speaker is from. And I just, uh, my wife and I just met uh, Pastor David on Friday, and we fell in love with him immediately. He has been at Christ Tabernacle for 30 years, so I already know he's a trooper, amen, and uh, persevering and all of that. And then he married, he happened to marry a wonderful woman of God who uh, we know for many, many years, she saw the boys grow up, they call her Titi Monique. And uh, uh, she was, we didn't know they were coming, and it was a surprise. So they came. They're also part of Christ's Tabernacle there, where our guests are from. And I, I wanted to introduce uh, this very, very special couple, Pastor Michael Durso and Pastor Maria Durso. <laughs> I've known them for over 40 years. And I've seen what God has done for them. And 32 years ago, God sent them out from Brooklyn Tabernacle to start the first church that grew out of Brooklyn Tabernacle, which is Christ Tabernacle. And there are uh, a, a, an amazing church there in Glendale, which is in Queens, New York, in the city, a very populated area there. Uh, they have grown by leaps and bounds. They have three services uh, in one campus and then two Spanish services in another campus and another English service at 630 in that Brooklyn campus, and God has done some, it's too many things for me to mention here, but God is using this ministry and Pastor Durst and all the workers there to bless people all around the world. They were uh, telling me about it uh, yesterday, and uh, yesterday we had uh, the opportunity to visit Crossroads, who's a, a, a ministry uh, of this church where they're our family, and uh, Maria was giving her testimony, and I knew it, but I haven't heard it for a long time. And I almost fell out of my chair. You got to hear this, but you're not going to hear it today. So everybody say, aw. aw. So that means that they must come back <laughs> to give it, amen. It will, it's through the roof. But I want to say about uh, Pastor Derso and pa Pastor Maria Derso that they are not just pastors. They are pastors' pastors. And uh, they uh, are the ones that uh, the first couple we turned to when God was speaking to our hearts to leave New York, which we were, my wife and I were terrified of the thought. And as God was making some things we thought clear, we said, we got to speak to somebody. And we called them. They cleared the calendar. We spent about five hours with them. They, uh, you know, confirmed in our hearts what the Lord was saying. They prayed over us. And uh, uh, he uh, has always made himself available to me. He's a person that I check in with to make sure that I stay straight. So would you join me in welcoming uh, a dear friend of mine and a pastor, <laughs> Pastor Michael Durso. Thanks, David. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus. Come on, come on, come on, better than that. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, Deep Waters. You may be seated. Um, 
The thing that's so exciting for my wife and I and for Pastor Dave and Pastor Monique is the years of being together in ministry. And then you see this great work happening here. There's nothing better to have the longevity. And to see kids grow up and now they're in ministry. And uh, it's just part of the blessing of the Lord. Um, I want my wife Maria to come up and just uh, greet you. Uh, we've been married 42 years. And... And that applause has to be with her because she's stuck with me for over four decades. But let her, let her greet you. Go ahead, Maria. I do hate when he does this. Um, but I am totally humbled, totally undone by what I see here. To think about how many years ago you came to our house in our living room, sat down hours and hours praying. They were terrified. You know, when God calls you to do something, you are terrified. And that brother said it so amazingly. You know, faith is the, is, is the circumstances that we have, and we're assured of failure unless God shows up. And God surely has led you, Pastor Joey and Missy, and your family. Um, the moment we came in yesterday, we did a, a, a small leaders meeting. And, and you know what? We're just brothers and sisters in the Lord. All we could share is our issues, our struggles, and tell you what not to do and maybe what to do. And um, because we're all really the same. But when I walked in this place yesterday, I just knew that it was holy ground. I just felt the presence of the Lord. And I cannot even imagine what God is going to do in this area where people from all different walks, every tribe, every tongue is going to come in this place because you know God's church isn't a white church or a black church or a brown church. It's all people. He came not to judge but to save, and he came for sinners just like us to give us good news so we could share with other people. So my encouragement to you is go out and share the grace of God with other people because the world needs to hear that there's a God that loves them unconditionally. And we, will, we have yet to see, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, what God will do for those who love him. Be blessed, Deep Waters Tabernacle, and the best is yet to come. God bless you. Again, to give, uh, to give uh, God the glory, and Maria does a better job at this than I do, but I'll give you a little snapshot. It was in September 1975 that uh, we were living together. So if you're living with someone, you're not married after the meeting, you come to us, we'll marry you. We're not judging. We're just saying you got to get it right to get blessed. We were living together. We were reckless. We were both been divorced. Uh, then we moved in together. We did drugs. It was just a crazy lifestyle. And then someone prayed for us. A bunch of people prayed for us. Uh, they were in, in Brooklyn. We were in uh, Mexico at a resort. And we heard those prayers. She felt those prayers all the way to 3,000 miles from a basement in Brooklyn to this resort in, uh, in Mexico. And uh, we went, came back to New York. They took us to a small little Pentecostal church. Never been to a church like service like this. I was raised Roman Catholic. I had a preconceived idea of what church is about. So was my wife. And uh, the pastor got up and just said, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would go? And that's the first time the both of us came to an awareness that we would not go to heaven. Uh, and they made an altar call, which we never seen before. And we came up and accepted Christ, whatever that meant. And I say that to you because that was 42 years ago. God not only saves you, he keeps you. Not only he saves you. And we were the worst... We were the worst candidates to be married because of all the drama and all the garbage and all the reckless living. Um, I would never marry Michael and Maria back in September of 75, but God is good. He's gracious, and uh, he's blessed us. We have a great church, and all our sons are pastors now, and uh, it's just an amazing, amazing time. So if you would, after I finish speaking, if you would have us back, we'd be more than happy to come back and, uh, and share that with you. But again, she does a much better job. We, we worship the Lord for about maybe, I'm not sure, maybe the tech guys could tell me, but probably 20 minutes to a half hour. Is that correct, guys? About that long was the set? 20 minutes to a half hour? And, um, which is about the amount of time we use also in Christ Tabernacle. And uh, you, you sense the presence of God. You, 
as Timmy opened up and started sharing what was on his heart to open up the worship uh, and the words that were being said and then all the lyrics from the songs, you, you felt presence. You felt God. You felt life. And, and yet the room, the room has people of different races, different ages, uh, men and women. And, and yet we're all different for about 20, 25 minutes in the same room. And we felt life because of what was being said. If, if I could say it this way, um, the worship team, and hey, do you love the worship team or what? Come on. They, they engineered the atmosphere, if I could use that kind of terminology, in a way that there was life in the room. God inhabits the praises of his people. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. So that's why we felt good. That's why we, there was an excitement in it. Now, if we take the same room with the same amount of people, Different ages, different races, uh, men and women. Um, and with the same amount of time, we said things that were not noble. Things that were not encouraging. Things, things that were not encouraging. Things that were discriminatory. Things that were damaging. Things that were abusive. We would have not felt life. We would have not felt life. All because of what we were saying. Just because of what we were saying. And so my... my, my sermon to you today is that words matter. What we say, how we speak to one another, what we say in our homes, on the job, uh, matters much. What we say in church matters much. And uh, this is more of a practical uh, theology approach to what I want to say. But I, I want you to just think for a moment, in our homes, in our ministries, we choose with our mouth what we're going to say, whether we will build up or tear down. We choose, we make a decision, whether we're going to say words that encourage or discourage. We choose words that are going to bless or words that are going to destroy. Words that do good or words that do harm. Proverbs 18.21 says this. The tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. When you visit a doctor and you usually go for a physical, some kind of checkup, he often tells you in the beginning of the examination, stick out your tongue. No, but doc, my leg hurts. It has nothing to do with my tongue. Yeah, okay, Durso, but stick out your tongue. I'll get to your leg. Stick out your tongue. Doctors can determine the health of your body by your tongue. And I think there's a spiritual correlation because you can determine the health of someone's spiritual life by the use of their tongue. What's on their tongue? Because the Bible tells us life and death are in the presence and the power of the tongue. We had this atmosphere where we said words that were encouraging and, and uplifting, and that's why we felt what we felt. But if we would have chosen another set of words, we wouldn't have felt that. Paul writes to the believers, and I want you to note that. It's to believers. And this is not so much about salvation. This is about conditioning. This is about that work that God wants to do. And he writes to the believers at the church at Ephesus, which he founded. In the fourth chapter, the 29th verse, it says, Do not, so that responsibility is on me, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Well, what's unwholesome? Well, anything that's not wholesome. No unwholesome words come out of your mouth. Listen to some of the other translations. The message translation says, do not let any foul or dirty words come out of your mouth. New Living says, do not allow any abusive words to come out of your mouth. New Century says, do not allow any hurtful words to come out of your mouth. And one more, Amplified, says, do not let, do not let any evil, polluting, or worthless words come out of your mouth. So Ephesians 4 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up. Encouraging others, strengthening others, motivating others. And, and here's the thing. The next verse is connected by an and. That, that word connects the verse 21 with verse 30. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for the building of others up. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but it makes sense to me that if I'm saying things that are unwholesome, I'm going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Because that word and connects the two verses. If I say things that are wholesome, well, then the Holy Spirit is going to be there. I think you all know this, that it's the Spirit that brings life. So when I say wholesome things, the Spirit's present, and there is life in whatever atmosphere or arena that I'm in. When I say unwholesome things, I grieve the Holy Spirit, so there's no life because there's no Spirit. And that might be, it might be, I'm not talking about salvation, but it might be why some believers never really experience the abundant life Jesus promised in John 10.10, because too often we don't guard what we say with our tongues, and we say things that are unwholesome, or we say things that are not encouraging, or we say things that are destructive, and so the Spirit's not going to remain 
in that kind of environment. And so the spirit's not there, so there's no life there. And as a result of no life there, I don't experience that, that abundant life, Jesus, that is available for all of us. That was Proverbs. Listen to what Peter says, the apostle. He takes from Psalm 34, but he writes this in his first letter, third chapter, 10th verse. He says, whoever, so that's all of us, whoever would enjoy or love life and see good days or God's favor must, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. Must. If I want to see good days, if I want to see the blessing of the Lord in my life, I need to make sure that I avoid negative speech. The opposite is true. If I do use negative words and I don't say, and I, and I talk things that are evil, I'm going to forfeit God's presence. And God's presence makes all the difference in the world. You can be going through some tough stuff, but the presence of God will give you the power and the anointing to get through it. Usually when I think of someone wrecking their life, uh, it's usually because maybe they've uh, chosen a destructive lifestyle or they're involved in, in drugs or alcohol. And, and all those things will wreck your life. Maybe there's an anger problem that's out of control. Yeah, that will wreck your life. But the Bible says here, in addition to those things, even if my, I choose words that are not right, if I speak words that are evil and deceitful, I'm going to wreck my life. The misuse of my tongue. Um, talking about other ministries, talking about other denominations is not the best thing to do. If you want to experience or maintain God's presence in your life. James, Jesus' half-brother, who most commentators he, believe he wrote the very first epistle, writes in the first chapter, the 26th verse, if anyone consider, considers himself religious. Okay, what would a religious person be like? I, and I'm not saying this uh, in a negative way, but I believe a religious person would come to church, would read their Bible, would uh, say prayers. I believe that in, in a good way. He says, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not control his tongue, New King James does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he, she denies himself and his religion is worthless. Guys, I don't want to get before the Lord. And he says, you know what, Durso, that's great. You had all these campuses in New York and you were doing all this and you had this amazing testimony and you got this deliverance from drugs and a reckless lifestyle. Um, but you know what? All that you did is worthless because, man, you said some nasty things on earth. You were talking about this one and gossiping about that one and complaining about that thing. And uh, I don't know, Michael, um, all that you did is kind of, kind of wasted. And, and, and remember this. Sometimes we can confuse talent with, spiritual, with a spiritual maturity. And that's not always true. Um, someone once said that, you know, it's, um, it's your talent that can get you in the room but it's your character that keeps you in the room. And so we have to be never confused that someone might be charismatic. Someone might be very talented, and then we think they're spiritually mature. You can tell, and not that I'm saying we're all supposed to be judges of one another, but you can tell where someone is by the way they use their tongue, the way they speak to their spouse, the way they speak to their kids. Uh, if you speak to your grandkids, that's perfect because our grandkids are perfect. But anyway, the way, you, the way you speak about other, other churches, other services, uh, even people that don't serve the Lord, the way you speak about them. Because remember, for God so loved the world. Not the saved world, just the world. And so I have to be really mindful. I, I want to make sure that I speak life and not death. And, and, and allow me to, being the age that we live in, that goes for texting and posting and blogging and doing all the things that we do with social media. Um, we had a young guy in our church that I, we had to correct because uh, on Monday he would post all these things about the church, and I don't, it, could, it probably was about our church, but it was, could, it was our church in general because when I asked him about it, he said, no, it, it's not Christ's time, it's just churches. And I said, yeah, but you're such a young man. How do you make these judgment calls? You know, are you an apostle? And even apostles would think twice before they would say the things you're saying on social media. You're saying the church is not this or the church is not that. But that's something you shouldn't be saying. And if there's something that you don't like, well, then approach the pastor or leader that maybe you disagree with and have a conversation. Go out for a cup of coffee. Talk things over. The best thing to do when you ever go into a conversation is to have this attitude that I might be wrong, not them. And, and this was a gifted man. I believe he loved the Lord, but obviously he was angry because he just posted all this stuff on Monday that was so grieving. And then once you put it out there, you know, you can't take it back. Um, you know, and, and you can even be right, but if you don't say it in the right way, uh, if you don't say it, I've, I've, I've learned this a long time ago, being right is not a fruit of the Spirit. 
but being kind is. Being kind is a fruit of the Spirit. So you might be right in your opinion or assessment of things, but how you present it, well, if you want God's blessing on it, you better present it in a way that there's kindness and gentleness and long-suffering. Uh, Moses was a great leader. I think we don't agree with that. The Bible says that he was the humblest of all men, and he had a great team and great organization, and God gave him an incredible vision and a blueprint of the tabernacle and where God wanted to take him. And he, he got in the presence of God, and so much so his face glowed. And I mean, it was amazing. But the Bible tells us that in Numbers 20, he got angry with the people. I'll speak to the leaders here. You might get angry with those with you, but if you speak harshly, beware. Because Moses got angry with the people because the people were complaining. That's true. You think they would have learned better. But look, we all, we're all a piece of work. God's working on all of us, right? Um, and uh, Moses got angry, and he goes to God. And the Bible says in Numbers 20, he went to the presence of God with Aaron. And God's glory came down. And he told God what was going on. And God said, okay, Mo, here's what I want you to do. Go to the rock, speak to the rock, and I'll give you water. But Moses was agitated. You know, we could be in the presence of God one moment and be in the flesh in the next. That doesn't happen here, but it happens a lot in New York. I know it doesn't happen down here. You got all these trees and grass and everything, so it keeps you neutral. But um, uh, he was in the presence of God, and then the minute he gets over to the people, he screams at the people and hits the rock twice. It's totally opposite of what God told him to do. And when you read the 106th Psalm, the Bible says that Moses used rash words and spoke uh, uh, foolishly, which kept him out of the full plan that God had for his life. Now, am I saying that Moses didn't go to heaven? No. We know in Luke 9, when Jesus came down on the Mount of Transfiguration, remember, who appeared to, who appeared to him? Elijah, Moses and Elijah. So we're going to see him there. The problem is he lost out on all that God wanted for him because he spoke he spoke in a way that wasn't right. He used words that were harsh and destructive, and, and that grieves the heart of God. Um, you know, it's interesting, the rest of Proverbs 18.21 says uh, that life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it eat its fruit. So there will be fruit in our lives by how we use our tongue. If you use your tongue in the right way, there's going to be good fruit, sweet fruit. Um, you might know this, but uh, Pastor Joey and Pastor Missy left this uh, basket of fruit in my room. Uh, with grapes and apples and pears, oh my, all these things. They were just, and, I, and I've been eating them because, you know, when you're preparing and studying, it's, 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 it's fresh, it's, 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 re, it's refreshing, it's not fattening, well, somewhat, but it was really, really good. And it was sweet. The fruit was perfect. Um, it's like our words. When we use our words in the right way, there's a sweetness to the fruit in your life. But the opposite is true. If your words are harsh and destructive and abusive, then your fruit um, it's rotten, toxic, it's not sweet at all. So we choose by what we say, how we talk, how the fruit in our lives is going to be evident. That's spiritual fruit. Matthew says this, well, Jesus says this, Matthew recorded in the 12th chapter, verses 34 and 37, that we will give an account for every careless word we speak. By your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be, you'll be condemned. So, I think it's safe to say that the fruitfulness in our lives depends on the use of our tongue. How fruitful someone is, the fruits of the Spirit that's evident in someone's life, is very dependent on, on the way we speak. Paul's in prison, and I'm sure he heard a lot of negative, horrible words. He's locked in prison, probably assuming that he's going to die, which he did die uh, not, not long after that. And he writes to this church in Philippi that he founded, and he writes in the second chapter, the 14th verse, he says, do everything, and don't you like, you know, struggle when God says do everything? God, really everything? I like, are you exaggerating or what? Every, no, everything, Durso. Okay, do everything without complaining, without whining, without grumbling, without murmuring. And here's why. He gives the reason why. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God with, uh, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars. Most commentators believe Paul wrote that in 60 AD. God already knew then the world was depraved. God already knew then that it was a dark world. But God wants us, the church of Jesus Christ, to shine. And, and, and the road to shine, the road to be illuminated is to make sure we do things without complaining. Because something happens to our spirit when we complain about things. Now, there are things that are wrong. I get that. But there's a way of going about it. You can bring all those things that concern you to the Lord, as, as Timmy was sharing later. 
Or you can complain and grumble and talk to your spouse or talk to your neighbor or talk to your ministry worker and just sprue things out that are not going to help either one of you. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. I found this, that when, when negative words are spoken, it's like the flu. It becomes airborne. And then it affects all the people around you. I mean, you could be in a great attitude, loving God, praising God, and somebody comes over, ah, wasn't the music too loud or too long or the room too cold, too hot? Ah. Man, it wrecks you. And we got to be on God because, listen, you know, we walk out those doors in here, we're fine. We're protected, and we got Pastor Joey and Pastor Missy and the worship team singing to us and, you know, giving exhortations and just kids coming up soon, the, the uh, uh, VBS coming up and all that. So we're excited, but then we go out those doors and we, we meet reality. You know, um, you, you, you go shopping, you go uh, um, you travel, however you, and somebody cuts you off. I mean, it's a perfect opportunity to want to say something that's probably not godly. I, my wife and I were in the gap. Uh, we were standing in the gap at the store. We weren't praying. We, I don't want you to think we're overly spiritual. But we were standing in the gap. We were getting some clothes for our grandchildren. And this woman just, like, cut ahead of us. It was a long line. It was one, two cashiers. And uh, we were fine with waiting, but this woman, and she had like an attitude. I know you don't get attitudes down here, but in New York, they have attitudes, facial attitudes. Like they're distorted in their look. And, and she, got, she got ahead of us, and her look was like, get, say something. Come on, say something. And listen, Pastor Joey said I've been pastor 32 years, but that old nature just started to rise up. Like I just wanted to correct her in a nice way. And, I, and I'm looking at her, and she's looking at me like she's just waiting for me. And she got ahead of with all these things that she had. And then all of a sudden, on the back of the line, I say, hola. I hear, hola, Pastor Durso. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and she comes up. I've never saw this woman before. She was with her, her daughter. And she told me that she goes to our Spanish campus. Uh, she's from Colombia, and she went on this whole conversation. She said, oh, I'm so happy to meet you. I don't get a chance to see you. And she's just going on, and she's saying all these great things. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, if she didn't speak sooner, she would have seen a picture of her pastor that wasn't that good. Sometimes this stuff happens in, in, in seconds, guys. That's why we always got to walk in the spirit. We got to make sure God keep us. I would have disappointed her. I would have disappointed her. And... Um, it's something that, you know what, all of us, there's none of us exempt, none of us leaders. Uh, there's a classic story in the book of Numbers. We talked about this yesterday with the leaders and the core team. Uh, you, you know that Moses, Aaron, and Miriam were Moses' older brother. And um, they got a little jealous of their brother being used by God. And sometimes the elders don't like or appreciate what God is doing in the youngers. You got to be careful about that. And... Uh, you know, the next generation does not look like the previous generation. They don't act like that generation. They ought not to. They're another generation. But remember, God is a generational God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we need to give wide margins before we start condemning and judging on the way they look, the way they dress, the music that they like, and all that. Um, but all that to say, Miriam and Aaron were Moses' older brother and sister, and God's speaking to Moses, and so obviously some jealousy came up. And they began to complain. They began to complain against Moses' wife, who was a Cushite at this time. His first wife was a Midianite. Most commentators believe she passed away. Uh, and then he remarried. And Cushites came from Ethiopia, so she was dark-skinned. So they were, making, they were disliking the fact that he married a Cushite. The premise was the fact that God was speaking to Moses. And um, they began to say things that were very negative about Moses. And if you know the whole story, Miriam uh, developed leprosy as a result of it. But my point for saying this is because in Numbers 12, verse 15, the Bible says, and the people of God could not move on. And man, that struck me. Being as a pastor, that, that the Red Sea didn't keep the people from moving on. Being in a desert where there's no food or water didn't keep the people from moving on. The Egyptian army could not keep the people from moving on. But gossip and complaining, murmuring, that stopped the people. I mean, words are powerful, guys. The Bible doesn't say life and death is in the power of the tongue to, think, to make us think that it's not that powerful. All of us have to be so careful about what we say and how we say it in our homes. When Pastor and Missy are not around, when the worship team is not singing, in our homes where we talk to our spouses. We'll, we'll get into depth a little later at the uh, tune-up. Is that what you called it, Mike? Yeah, Matt, that's a great thing. I'm going to steal that title from you. 
And they don't call it stealing in the things of God. We call it gleaning. We're gleaning. We're gleaning. So, but I mean, the way we talk to our spouses at home, the way we talk to our children, um, we have to be very careful how we speak. Um, how many have pets here? Come on, raise your hand. Pets. Okay. Dog lovers, cat lovers, canary lovers. Okay. We have a neighbor. Uh, and of course, New York, everything is much closer. I'll call it a backyard, but you know, it's a little piece of dirt. Um, and and, and uh, there's a fence that goes down, and my neighbor next door uh, lives there. And I'm an early, I'm a morning person, so I'll get up in the morning. I like to go outside, especially with the weather like this, and pray and read my Bible. And it's really quiet in our neighborhood. It, it is it's during the summertime. Um, but this woman next door, she's also a morning person. And her side door opens up right where my chairs are at the back table in the backyard. And... Um, in the morning, she lets her little dog out. I've never seen the dog, but it sounds like it's small. And I love dogs. Uh, but uh, every morning, M M Maria is her name. She comes out, and she goes, come on, baby. Come on, come on. Come outside. Come on. Come on. Mommy's with you. Come on, come on. It's so good. Come on, come on, come on. Come outside. Please come out. I, I visualize this because I hear her walking. Come on, baby. You want some water? You want some? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a dog. Yeah. And then her husband calls her. Her husband's name is Jerry. Maria, what? I want the dog. Yeah, some of us talk better to our pets than we do to our family. <laughs> Only in New York. Doesn't happen down here. I get it, but it happens in New York. Think about this. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He never said anything bad about them. And the Bible says the, Lord, the hand of the Lord was with him. David was hounded by Saul and never complained about Saul. Esther was forced into a marriage. She never complained about it. Daniel was kidnapped, never complained about it. And Paul and Silas and Timothy and Titus and all the stuff they went through to give us the Gospels and the epistles never complained about the situations that we're in. We, we so need to understand, we need to speak words that, not flattery, but words that encourage Words that motivate, words that, that strengthen, words that are, well, Pastor Durso, that's not really me. No, it can be me because the Bible says we can do all things to Christ who strengthens us. And I, and I would encourage every family here to encourage one another. And in fact, that's probably the area where we do it the least. It's just the makeup of things, but we don't encourage our spouses as often as we should. All of you after this meeting can tell me, hey, Pastor, that was a great word. But I'll tell you, if my wife tells me that, that means more to me than anybody else. Not disrespecting you, but that's my spouse. That's my wife. When she says, hey, that was a good word. Because I know if it wasn't, she'd say, hey, Durso, <laughs> go work on that word, you know. We don't tell our family enough, uh, our children enough, how great they are, how we love them, how we appreciate them. And, yeah, we all make mistakes. I get that. But, you know, what? when we encourage one another and strengthen one another, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The word encourage means to put courage in. The word discourage means to take courage out. You know, in the book of Hebrews, twice in the beginning and the end, it tells us that we are to encourage one another, not once in a while, daily, daily. Not flattery that doesn't get you anywhere, but encourage one another, encourage one another. The Bible's so strong about that. And um, listen, I, listen uh, I, I get this. There are things that come that are not very appealing, not very satisfying. But I'm telling you, if you use your tongue to speak life, to be, speak gratitude and thankfulness. It's amazing how God will change your world, change your perception, change even your situation. Do you remember uh, the feeding of the 5,000? That's classic, right? All four Gospels recorded it. The feeding of the 4,000, Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded it. But that's seven times the Scriptures record this event where there was this huge need and very little resources. 5,000 plus people, five loaves and two fish, right? That doesn't even make five decent sandwiches. Um, and they had this situation, and, and we've said this before, that whenever the Bible addresses something more than once, you need to think twice about what it says. Whenever the Bible addresses something more than once, think twice about what it says. Well, here, this is seven times. And, and the disciples complained, oh, God, you know, send the people away. Oh, Jesus, there's too many people. It would take more money than we could ever imagine to buy all the food necessary. And, and that's what we do when we find ourselves usually in a financial situation. We complain of our lack of resources, our lack of funds, the need is too, too big. And I would like to suggest to us 
that before we get into the complaining part, if the Holy Spirit could help us remember that when we find ourselves where there is a shortage, a resource shortage, and we need more financial means to meet that resource, then I would think the best thing to do is take what you have and just begin to open up your mouth and thank God for what you have. Because that's what Jesus did. He thanked God for the five loaves and two fishes, and then God did the miracle. I, I, I'll stand on God's word. That if you begin to thank God, that paycheck that comes in, that bill that comes in, whatever it might be, you just begin to thank God for his provision. Watch how God will answer your situation in ways that are miraculous. Otherwise, the Bible's not true. It's that speaking life with your tongue. God, I thank you for my salary. My natural mind says, oh, but it's not enough. I'm not going to complain about that it's not enough. I'm going to complain that I got a job and I got a salary and I thank you for that salary and I thank you for where I live and I thank you for the clothes on my back and I thank you for the food that I eat. It goes a long way. It goes a long way. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And we need to speak things that are just wholesome. We're going to talk again about this a little later uh, with the tune-up, the marriage tune-up. But, you know, I mean, our, our marriages, we can complain about them, or we can thank God for them. Well, you don't know my wife. No, I don't. But I know God. I know God. And if you're married to that person, then God's going to bless that. And as long as you open up your mouth and speak words that are are life-giving. It's amazing what God could do and turn, turn your marriage around and need be. Um, it's just something that, that, that you see in the scriptures. In the book of Acts, the Paul and Silas, you know the story, right? They were beaten, put in a prison, put in stocks, in a dungeon. And, uh, and if that was me, I mean, I, I would be complaining, especially if I was following Paul. Really, Paul? Is this, this your idea of sharing the gospel? Really? My back is bleeding. I'm in stocks. I'm in a dirty dungeon. And you call this the ministry? I... I'd be the first one to tell you, to be true, truthful with you, I'd be complaining. But you know what? Paul and Silas saw a, a, a found a place in God where they realized praise, thanksgiving does a lot of things to your situation. And you know the story in Acts 16? Instead of complaining, instead of murmuring, instead of praying prayers, get us out of this jail, they just began to praise God. They just began to worship God. And if you know the story, what God did is God shook that building, opened every door, not just their door, but every door, and all the chains come down, and there was this deliverance. From what? From praise, from thanksgiving, from honoring God, from speaking words of life instead of words that are destructive and, 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 and thank you and then affirmative. It's, it's, it's amazing what God can do with our words. Sometimes we dismiss this because we feel it's, you know, it's tripe. But it's the little foxes. Song of Solomon 2.50. It's the little foxes that ruin the vine. Ecclesiastes 10.1 says it's one fly in the ointment that ruins the ointment. Sometimes it's those little things that uh, we just dismiss or overlook because it's not, you know, it's not crack cocaine. It's not an adulterous affair. It's just, you know, I'm just talk, trash talk. Well, it's in the kingdom. It's, it's serious. Uh, there was a, not too long ago, uh, Pastor David lived that one time in Staten Island. And um, I think it was two years ago, David Fitzpatrick, he was a 15-year-old boy, went to parochial school, and um, he was bullied. And you look at the, the kid was a handsome kid. He was a smart kid. Um, and uh, he was bullied for whatever reason. We don't know what they said to him. But he went home one day, and he hung himself. And his sister found him. And the whole reason why he hung himself was he couldn't take anymore because he was being bullied. Not beaten up, not punched, not kicked, just bullying. Oh, back in June, uh, again, I don't know if it made it up here, but there was in Massachusetts, there was this couple uh, that were texting back and forth. They had a relationship via tux texting. And the guy was in a truck, and they both had issues, and he was talking about suicide, and she texted him into committing himself, to, into, into committing suicide. And they brought her up on charges of murder. That just happened just last month. Through texting, through words, life and death are in the power of the tongue, or through your cell phone. But then once you get those words out there, it's amazing how that can destroy people. And, pee. and you know what, guys? Let me say this, too. The devil loves when we say, oh, he'll never change. Oh, she'll never change. Ah, oh, my marriage will never get. Oh, I'll never be able to buy a home. Oh, and we just say, oh, the devil loves when we say that because we're talking death. He hates when we say, I'm believing God that that son of mine is going to go up and be a man of God or that daughter, a woman of God, or my marriage is going to be an example for others to follow. And whatever, God, whatever home, whatever covering God gives me, I'm going to thank him for that. Man, that's how you come against the devil. Talk about spiritual warfare. Speaking life, speaking life. You know, in the valley of dead bones, God told the prophet to speak life over those dead bones. 
Don't complain about them. Just speak life over them. And it's, it's amazing what words can do. Paul tells Timothy in his first letter, chapter 4, verses 12, being an example in speech. Be an example in speech. Remember the story of Elijah? First Kings 17, 18 comes out of nowhere. Man of God, I mean, birds are feeding him. I mean, the brook is giving him water. He says it's not going to rain for three and a half years until I say so. King Ahab tries to kill him. Everybody's trying to get him. Nobody gets him. Finally, when, when, the, end, when the end time comes, uh, he tells King Ahab, look, at all your prophets of Baal and meet me up on this Mount Carmel. And, and we'll find out what God is real. And uh, there was, they build this trench uh, and they pile wood on it, and they get this uh, uh, sacrifice on it, and whoever, call, whoever God answers by fire is, is, is God. And so he let them go first, and these guys are dancing around, they're cutting themselves, they're chanting, speaking these mantras for fire to come down, the God of Baal and, and uh, God of Ashtoreth and all this, and nothing happens. And then Elisha comes, and he calls down God, and fire comes. And powerful. And they kill all these prophets, 450. What a man of God. And then somebody challenges him, Jezebel, says, by tomorrow I'm going to kill you. And he runs. He gets depressed. He leaves his servant, which means he leaves his ministry. And he tells God, kill me. I'd rather die. He got suicidal because somebody just threatened him. Somebody said something with words. This was the prophet Elijah. Man, this is the guy that he saw God do incredible things. And yet because somebody said something negative to him, he wanted to quit. Paul again tells Timothy as his last letter, 2 Timothy 1, 3, he said, hold fast to the pattern of sound words which you heard me speak. You know, Timmy, musicians, maybe you can come, please. Um, the Bible says this, Matthew, Matthew 12 and Luke 6, twice it's recorded. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So actually, everything that I've just said is really an indication of where our heart is. Because what we say is like an x-ray of what's going on in here. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when I'm saying negative things about my marriage, it's because my heart is not right towards my wife. When I'm saying negative things about my church, it's because my heart is not right about my church. When I say negative things about my country or my neighborhood or whatever, other churches, it's because that's what's in my heart. And it's an indication that, you know, our words are an indication of where our heart is at. And um, uh, my wife does this really well. She quotes Proverbs 4, 23, 24. Above all else, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. Listen, put away perversive, per perversive speech from your mouth and keep corrupt talk out of your lip. God knew you put the heart and the tongue together because what's coming out of here is a direct result of what's in here. So this is a kind of bold statement, and maybe I shouldn't assume but everyone in this room has a heart and a tongue. And every one of us are subject to saying things that we ought not to say because of something in our heart. So I'm going to ask all of you to stand, please. And I'd like you to close your eyes and just kind of block everybody else around you. And just, just let's just get sensitive to the things of God. And I'm going to ask Pastor Joey to come up and pray for us. And... and let, let's, let's just be honest. Let's be genuine with God. Let, let's use this opportunity of asking God to cleanse our heart in any area where maybe we're bitter or we felt betrayed or we took offense or we're hurt so that when, 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 when God cleanses our heart, we'll be saying things that are encouraging and motivating and things that are beneficial and things that will build up our spouse or build up our family or build up our ministry brothers and sisters in a way that would glorify God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, God, uh, thank you for speaking to our hearts today. Lord, we recognize, Lord, that this is something that speaks to every single one of us, Lord God. Lord, there's times, oh God, Lord, where we don't even realize we're doing it, Lord Jesus. Your word warns us, oh God, that we've learned how to tame, Lord, some vicious animals. But no one has been able to tame the tongue, oh God. Lord, we need your help. And today, Father, on behalf 
of myself and my family and our church. We repent, Father. We ask you to forgive us, God, for all, Lord God, of those death words, oh God, that we may have spoken, oh God, either realizing it or not realizing it, oh Lord Jesus. Help us and teach us, oh God, to put a guard on our heart, O oh Lord God, and a guard on our tongue, Lord Jesus. God, your word is clear, Lord God, that a fountain can't both have salt water and fresh water coming out of it, oh God. And Lord, I pray, Father, since you're the source of our water, God, that you wouldn't fill us with rivers of living water flowing out from us, oh God, to living words, words of life, oh God, that we would speak life into our marriages, life into our families, life into our friends, life at our jobs, life in our church, life in this community, oh God, because of the positive, Lord, Lord God, words that are coming out, words of life. You've given us plenty of words of life to speak, oh God. Lord, and we look to you. Lord, we are needy people. We're not embarrassed to say that. We're not ashamed to say that, God. Lord, we can't do one thing without you, Lord God. Your word is clear about that as well. So, Father, I pray that you would fill us, God, with your Holy Spirit. Make us aware of ourselves, Lord Jesus. God, purify our hearts. God, we say, Lord God, like the psalmist David, Lord, examine our hearts, Lord God. Search our hearts, oh God, and see if there's any wicked way in there, oh God. And lead us in the way everlasting, Lord Jesus. Create in us a clean heart, Father, a clean heart, Lord Jesus, so that we can serve you. Lord God, the way that you so rightly deserve to be served, oh God. But even that, so that we would live, Lord, good lives, Lord Jesus. That's what you want. That's why you tell us that, God. It's not so much for you. It's for us because you love us. And you want us to live blessed lives. And you want to bless us, oh God. Help us, oh God. Help us, Lord Jesus, that the living word would be in us, oh God. To speak life, oh God. To speak life wherever we go, Lord. Life wherever we step, oh God. Life wherever we are, Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if, if this word has specifically gone to you, raise your hand. I want to speak, especially for those that God is speaking to. No one's looking around. Yes, just raise your hand. I want to pray. Yes, there's a lot of, Lord God, I just thank you, Father, for, Lord, the word coming alive in our own hearts, in our lives, God. You see, Lord, your people, oh God, Lord, they, they're asking, God, for your help. Lord, and there's no one that has ever asked for your help, God, that you have not helped. There's not, a, Lord, a single instance of anyone, Lord God, in the history of the world who needed and asked for your help and didn't receive it. I pray a special dispensation, God, of your Holy Spirit and of your power. Lord, you're keeping power just like Lord Pastor Durso said. You not only save, but you keep us. And Lord, you could help us to keep our hearts and tongue pure before you, Lord Jesus. So, God, I ask that you do this in us. Create a new work in us, Lord Jesus, and use us for your honor and for your glory. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap offering.